Okay, perfect. Okay, so yeah, it's really nice to have lots of familiar faces from last week um, and lots of new names as well. And um, maybe you've joined us before. Um, this is the fourth and our last um, episode. <laughs> is that the right word in the series? Um, uh, some of you I know are probably starting your dip or delta journey soon. So um, this is hopefully sending you off with a little bit of some new ideas maybe, um, or maybe some ideas you've been having um, and sort of helping plant a seed, I suppose. That's probably the main idea here this evening, this afternoon, morning, um, is to plant a little seed maybe of something to ground us and anchor us when we're in the classroom. And maybe even before we're in the classroom, more than even in the classroom. Um, it's about what we bring into the classroom, um, what we focus on in the classroom, um, and what helps us make decisions. Um, and that kind of thing that we're talking about is authenticity. Um, books have been written on this, you know, it's not something that we can cover completely in an hour, but we're going to try and keep it as focused on the dip and the delta teaching practice assessment and helping you um, meet criteria, I suppose, and make lessons as um, valuable as you can for your learners. So uh, without further ado, um, in the chat, the theme is authenticity. Um, any keywords or associations that you have with authentic authenticity and um, being a language teacher. Um, so this could be from anything from anything at all, uh, a word, a definition. Okay, nice. Thanks. I'm not going to read everybody's ideas out. So if you want to keep an eye on the chat, that's a great idea. Um, if there's anything that we need more information about, I might just follow up. Okay, great. So we have lots of uh, similar ideas happening about real. The word real is coming up a lot. Yeah. So that's kind of almost like a core part of the meaning, isn't it, of being authentic or authenticity. And then we have the idea of authentic materials. Yeah, that's coming up a couple of times there. Okay, yeah, real stuff. Okay, nice. Okay, yeah, great. So we have common, some common um, concepts coming up in the chat. Let's have a look at um, a, a bit of a, a bit of a definition or an exploration of of an associated idea or the idea of genuine language, or which is very associated. I think it's coming from the idea of being real um, that many of you mentioned. This comes from Widdowson. So Widdowson way back in the 70s talked about this. Let's see if we can complete the um, definition together. So it starts with, you gotta finish, you gotta give me the next word of the definition. You can pop it in the chat. I have something from Ahmed, so yeah. So close, it's a bit, language is maybe a very close term to the word that's gonna come up, which is discourse, yeah? So one of those very dip delta words, <laughs> isn't it, discourse? Um, so the idea of here, we're, we're really talking about maybe text really, text not being, like a book necessarily or a magazine, but a spoken or a written um, text, like a conversation is a text, isn't it? Or this webinar that I'm giving, if we had a transcript of it, that, that's a text. Um, we're in the middle of a text right now because a text is, or discourse is a kind of speaker, listener, or speaker and audience, or writer and audience, and there's a relationship there, there's a kind of communication happening, and if you know who Widdowson is, you'll know that um, the whole uh, stuff, Widdowson stuff is a communicative approach, right, communicative stuff, so we're not surprised to see a word like discourse, and it's designed to meet a, what's it designed to meet? Nice, Ahmed, yeah, okay, very oh, good. So spot on there, some people in the chat. Yeah, so uh, it's not 
for display purposes, right? A text isn't to display, a text isn't to, mm, for, for the sake of itself. It has a reason it's been written or we are speaking or it was spoken. People spoke for a reason. They had something to do communicatively. Um, okay, so uh, it's directed at play people look, playing their roles in a normal, 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 I like that word. Well, I mean, it's interesting, right? Okay. Yeah. Close, close to, to, to setting, I guess, is a social context. Yeah. So here we have the idea of a text as a real thing that happened or happens um, that has a real reason for communicating or sharing something and that it's situated with real people, people doing something real in a social context. So there's the idea of someone else being involved or an audience being involved. Um, <clears throat> this is what Widdison contrasts with uh, a contrivance yeah, for teaching. So when you have a text that's only purpose maybe has been produced or um, created only to teach what? That's what we all do, teach language. Okay, so here I suppose what Widdison is talking about a long time ago is the idea that uh, sometimes we bring texts into the classroom that have been produced only to teach some bit of language, but they're not um, real texts. They're not authentic texts. Um, they have not been produced for by people saying something or trying to communicate something. They've been produced by course book writers, by teachers, um, by somebody who has to put five examples of uh, past modals into a newspaper article. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's, there's a real temptation for that kind of text to come into our classrooms because pedagogically, those kind of texts, you know, they can we can create texts that have lots of examples of of language in them, maybe that's good, that's a good thing for our learners, we might think, um, they see it, and we all know that learning is much more powerful if we have multiple examples of a, of a target structure. So, and we have a question already in the, in the chat about simplifying authentic materials. I think it's a really good question. Um, can we come back to that, Peter? Can you hold that thought? Um, but I think it's a really good one, and I'd, li I'd really like to return to it a little, in a little bit in the session yeah but it's a really good question um and, and, and trying to find how we use authentic materials is really the question isn't it um okay so so there's that side of um, text that we bring in you know and sometimes we're going to do that but when we're talking about um authentic material or authenticity um the question that we want to think about is like why is it important in the classroom that we don't always do that thing where we bring in a display text? And I'm not saying we should never do it. And in fact, I, I, I do use text and I think we can use those kind of texts effectively for certain things. But why is it important that we have as much authenticity to what we're doing as possible? Any thoughts in the chat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think there's a, a wide range of answers and I, I think they're all really valid. Um, I think part of it is about the learning. So some people have mentioned about being exposed to real language. And I think there's a kind of learning element there or what's going on there is that by exposing learners to real language, to authentic language, we're exposing them to language that we, we want them to that to turn into uptake, right? And so by exposing them to it, we might be able to show them models of it. And in turn, then they can choose what they like. But if we only show them kind of contrived texts or um, texts that have been produced for display purposes, we're not maybe helping them in that um, acquisition process because what they might be acquiring is not particularly natural or 
that kind of thing. Yeah. And then you have the other side of it as well, which is a more affect side, perhaps. So that's people have mentioned about motivation. Yeah. Because authenticity at its heart is a very kind of personal and individual thing. And it is connected to learners, why they're learning and trying to align what we bring into the classroom but what learners are trying to do with language or what they want to do with language. And we're going to definitely explore that in this session, how we can help align that as closely as possible. So that's a massively powerful um, um, factor. Yeah, definitely. It can be too, it can be demotivating if the text is too difficult. So this is something we have to balance. Yeah, the motivation of having something authentic with the fact that it might be too difficult. OK, great. OK, so let's all really good ideas in the chat, guys. Let's move on just to maybe explain a little bit what the main three things that we're hopefully going to get a chance to look at, though. I know time is tight and we may not get to explore all of these in as much detail. But the first thing is um, about authenticity and language. What actual language do we bring into the classroom? Or even how do we go about bringing language into the classroom? How can we be authentic in our planning approach? Yeah. Um, then we have what text, if we're choosing reading or listening, how do we choose those texts? What text do we choose for our learners? And the third thing is how do we design productive tasks, speaking or writing, that have authenticity at their heart? Um, and these are kind of three very different aspects of authenticity in the classroom. Okay, let's look at the language one first. Um, when you're preparing a dip or delta assessed lesson, but also I would say, you know, in our teaching in general, because of course they should be aligned with each other. But certainly these are some questions that we need to think about. We need to think about if we want to use a course book, does the course book that we're choosing to use for our assessment, is it using genuine models? And is it the kind of material, not just that we have to use, but that we want to use? Yeah, so when it comes to assessment, I think it's really important that you have a critical eye on what you're bringing into the classroom. Even if that is the course book that you have to use, maybe you can source something more appropriate for that lesson, yeah, for that assessment. And I know that lots of people are constrained by, by, by lots of things and when it comes to their teaching curriculum. But, you know, let's question the examples. Let's also question the models that are included. For example, um, the speakers or the authors, are they writers, speakers, um, L English users that our learners are interested in reading or listening to? And also, are they ones that they can feel motivated and aligned to? So I know that the whole area of um, nativism and native speaker and non-native speaker is massive, but could it be that we could bring some L two speakers into our classroom, some models that might be more motivating for our learners because they can feel like it might be something they could aspire to um, when it comes to maybe listening and things like that. So we're talking about looking at those and being a bit critical about those kind of things. Um, I'm talking about accent, all that, that kind of stuff, yeah? Uh, so, so model doesn't just mean grammar or vocabulary, it can also include phonological aspects of the model that we're using. Um, and also the length, you know, are we looking at kind of overly long texts or unnecessarily boring texts when we could be bringing something shorter and more appropriate for our learners into the classroom to achieve the same kind of outcome maybe at the end? OK, um, and yeah, in terms of topics as well, of course, yes, I think that's Maria who's mentioned topics as well. Um, what kind of topics are our learners going to be interested in? Also, when it comes to the practice activities that we're including, um, like, are they practice activities that promote genuine language use or are they the kind of practice activities that like close down genuine language use? Um, and even at very low levels, this is still true. You know, when you look at a practice activity, does it um, relate to the real world? So that's something we need to, to ask ourselves when we're looking at material too. And the last thing, <laughs> which is really probably the most important thing from a second language acquisition kind of mechanism, if you like. Um, when we get the learners to use language in the classroom, let's call it the free practice or um, the, the, the task, the, 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 the part where they're supposed to use the past continuous. Are they using the past continuous because we told them to use the past continuous? Did we say, 
now tell your partner a story or tell your partner about um you know a kind of accident or strange experience you had make sure you use three examples of the past continuous if that's what we're doing in the classroom um there's not much authenticity in that because if learners do use three examples of the past continuous all they're doing is displaying right they're not there's no um, that back to that with us an example they're not being authentic their language production is not authentic they're contriving what they say to meet your requirements but if we and if we do that we can't really say that they've learned anything just because they use three examples of the past continuous that's not to say that use of language doesn't indicate learning it just means that it doesn't necessarily indicate learning yeah and when we ask the learners to do something are we focusing on um the right things when we set it up yeah and that's important because we can't just tell them to use the past continuous and then be happy that they use the past continuous that's not genuine that's not authentic because in real life nobody says a sentence with the past continuous to say a sentence with the past continuous they want to say something they want to communicate something so are we setting goals and tasks for our learners that focus on that communicative element yeah so the, yeah no surprises is that is there the main question that we have to ask ourselves is that is there a communicative goal to the lesson and this goes back to something we talked quite a lot about last week yeah making sure that we have communication at the heart so uh for example um this is a sort of summary of what one teacher an imaginary teacher um thinks they are doing in their assessed lesson you can see it summarized in the kind of creepy whitey box. Yeah. Now, <laughs> the question I have is Is there a genuine communication or communicative goal to this lesson? So the teacher is doing a delta lesson to review the third and mixed conditional forms. They're using test, teach, test. They're going to use some gap fill and they're going to do lots of comparing, contrasting, and then they're going to do some controlled and free practice. This is sort of the problematic way to plan an assess lesson because it's the surefire way to not get the learners to really produce language authentically. This is the way to get them to do what you want them to do, maybe or maybe not. And this is unfortunately what we, we often do in the classroom and then wonder why they're not learning, right? So um, instead, I want to do a lesson on the third conditionals. Yeah, I want to do Galina. Good question. Yeah, there is none in the on the on the left hand side. There's none. But what about if I chose one of these three? So can you see my three um, options down below? If I chose one of these three as my communicative goal, I could still do all of these things on the left in the lesson, but they wouldn't be the point of the lesson. The point of the lesson would be to get the learners maybe to talk about a lucky encounter that they had. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so these are three possible lessons. These are lessons that I've done to, to develop learners' ability to use the third and mixed conditionals. How about you guys? In the chat, could you add any other nice communicative goals that you've used in lessons to get learners using the third conditional or mixed and or mixed conditionals Any other? Okay, so the um, communicative goal, Peter can't see how the communicative goal, it's a good point. I, I didn't really explore it much, I expected. <laughs> okay, so a lucky encounter. 
if everybody just takes a moment to think about a lucky encounter they've had. And if you were to talk about that lucky encounter, I know a very lucky encounter. I once nearly got stuck in um, Cambodia without a passport, but uh, a friend of mine who happened to be in the country at the same time uh, kind of found my passport weirdly. But if she hadn't found it, I would never have, um, I would never have, uh, I would never have got out of the country really, or I would have, it would have taken a really long time to get out of the country. Um, I could tell you more about that. But in that lesson, if we work towards a lucky encounter, we could get learners doing a task or a test teach test where they have a go at doing the, that task or look at a model maybe. They review the third conditional through the model. Then we compare the grammar of the third conditional and mixed conditional. And then we follow on to get them to maybe write some control sentences about their own um, lucky encounters. And finally, they have a chance to, in pairs, do the task themselves where they talk about their lucky encounter. So the things on the left are included within, is that all right, Peter? Yeah, the things on the left are included in order to help the learners be better able to talk about a lucky encounter. They're kind of almost, yeah, like, like the how we would achieve it. So if you're doing a Delta lesson, you might have communicative objective, lucky encounter, and then you might have, this will be achieved by one, two, and three, for example. Cool. So there's some lovely um, examples in the chat about different um, different ideas for getting um, learners yeah, using this language. I think something that we should just keep in mind when we are talking about communicative goals, um, the more, not super specific, but the more relevant and more, let's call it um, real, that the conversation that we get the learners to have, the better the lesson will be. I'll take an example, which is regrets. Yeah, it's a classic example that course books present the third conditional in. I don't know about you, but I don't have a conversation about regrets very often in my life. Maybe every, you know, five or six years after like a couple of bottles of wine too many, um, I might have that conversation, yeah? <laughs> depending what company I'm in. But it's not a sort of typical conversation. And I'm not saying that, you know, talking about a lucky encounter is a typical conversation. But that story that I have about losing my passport in Cambodia is a story I tell. Yeah, it's a, it's a thing we have in our lives, you know, things we talk about maybe a bit more often. Choices, you know giving reasons for choices, justifying choices. Regrets, I think, is a really broad thing. But if we like narrowed it a little bit to maybe talking about um, something that they've bought in their lives that they really regret, or something that they didn't buy that they regret not buying, then I think we're getting closer to a conversation that's real. Is this, make, is this kind of making sense? It's like sometimes course books present what they call context, like regrets, but really it's a topic. Regrets is not that go back to that beginning, that authentic text. Regrets is not someone talking to somebody about something. It's sort of maybe the topic at the background, but the talking to someone about something is sharing with your friend a regret of something you've bought recently, yeah, or haven't bought. That's a that's a kind of closer to a a, a context, yeah, because context has a speaker trying to do something more specific than talk about a topic yeah in the same way that talking about your favorite football team isn't really a context but talking about the player who's had the most impact on the on your favorite team this year is a context is that kind of making sense and the more we can get to that like that's the real conversation that we have that's maybe the conversation yeah but so this is where authenticity comes into communicative goal and task design is that okay for everybody? Yeah. Any more questions? M Maria, are you okay with that? I can see that you've asked why it's not. Okay, we can move on. And if there's any more questions about it, we can come back to it. Okay, so that's about your language choice or how you bring language into the classroom. But what about the text that we bring in? So 
I'm not uh, sort of trying to dissociate things, but we might not be looking at grammar or Lexis or anything like that. We might be trying to do like, you know, some reading um, or some listening for development of skills, especially if you're doing a Delta or a diploma lesson, you might be focusing on those things. Um, but how do you choose a text? Um, I mean, if you're gonna use an authentic text from all the authentic texts in the world, and there are just billions, where do you start? Um, when you bring that into the class, are your learners gonna like it? And mm, quite significantly for uh, assessment purposes, like, can you kind of state that this is useful? Can you put in your lesson plan a really solid rationale for why you're bringing this text in? Not just, I think they're gonna like it, that's not really going to cut it, you know, at the assessment level, or I really like it, or everybody likes this, don't they? Um, so we, we want to be a little bit, bit, bit more um, kind of considered in our rationale. So uh, one technique that we can use is, yeah, very good, Peter, about <laughs> needs analysis. One of the kind of uh, leading figures in needs analysis, especially if you're into kind of a task-based approach, would be Mike Long, um, who actually passed away last year, but if you look at any of Long's work, needs analysis is at the very heart of what he does. Um, not just any old needs analysis, but uh, the course content is determined by learners present and or future, something needs. What kind of needs? Nice, Anthony, yeah. Maria Jose, spot on, Peter spot on, yeah, communicative needs. So going back to that point that it's not about what language they don't have or have, but it's about why they need language, what's it for. Um, needs analysis, the classic needs analysis is, you know, um, why are you learning English? Uh, what do you want to do? Um, what, you know, so these questions, um, you know, do you like doing this? What skill are you good at? Um, what topics are you interested in? Maybe a little bit of diagnostic grammar testing probably sounds quite familiar. That's the classic needs analysis. And that can give us a certain amount of insight. But I think one problem with that kind of needs analysis is that it doesn't always help us choose the most appropriate texts or tasks to bring into the classroom. So another, yeah, exactly. When you ask learners what they need English for, in my experience, they're not really able to articulate or pinpoint enough with enough detail to help you plan a course yeah they can you they get you can get a certain way with it but as a question it's not so helpful and this is kind of the point that, well i mean the direct question to anybody whether whether we're talking about any context not just teaching but in life a direct question doesn't always get you as far as other techniques that might work um, as well to support the information you get so a really useful technique that we've used and that i use <laughs> a lot, my learners are probably bored stiff of it at this stage, is um, the idea of a future ideal learner self. Um, this is something that comes from um, the L2 motivational self system theory or concept or framework or however you want to call it um, by Zoltan Dornier. And Dornier is your main motivation man. <laughs> um, his L2 motivational self system works a little bit like this. Let's have a go. So uh, I want everybody to choose a language that they um, are currently learning with any level of success or with any level of um, ability. So it's a language that you are not ma you have not mastered yet. Can everybody think of such a language? You can be either an active learner or a not very active learner of that language. Can you pop the language into the chat? Great. Okay. Oof. Thai, my goodness. That is a challenge. Okay. So, uh, this is how the use of an ideal learner self needs analysis goes. You can do it as a um, visualization. You can do it as a, a written task. You can do it as a conversation with a partner. You can do it lots of ways. But the way you do it is you ask the learners to imagine themselves in the future. It can be 
like at the end of the course that you're teaching, it can be a year in the future, you choose the time frame that's most appropriate for your learners. So can we all, all of us, think of um, ourselves as the language speakers that you've popped in the, um, in the chat in, uh, in one year's time? Yes, yeah? so in one year's time, you are speaking this language. You're speaking it better than you speak it now because you've learned lots. Um, who are you speaking to? Can you visualize yourself speaking to somebody in a year's time? So who are you talking to? Can you pop it into the chat? Lots of people have friends in other languages, nice. Okay, wow. Oh. Great, okay. Nice. OK. And what are you talking about in this conversation that you're having in a year's time? What are you doing in the conversation? Like socializing, catching up, these kind of things, right? Some people, other people are doing more formal things like uh, academic stuff. OK. All right. Nice. Delivering CPD sessions. Impressive. Nice. OK, cool. Telling jokes. Yeah. <laughs> OK. All right. Um, and you can develop this and we could go on, but we don't because we don't have time. So this is the idea is that you get learners projecting their their image of themselves, their ideal learner. So they are this is their most successful selves in the future. And you ask them to think about what they're doing, what they're who they're speaking to, what they're talking about, um, what's their listening ability. Um, what what are they listening to what are they watching what are they reading in that language um what are they writing in that language so you basically do a kind of um uh yeah a needs and a communicative needs analysis around this whole whole idea as i said i've done this you know using google forms i've used it doing i've done it using like a guided visualization in the moment in the lesson i've done it like on flipgrid you know there's lots of different ways you can do it to gather the data um, and then you do like you can do pair work or you can do no no follow-up communicative work as long as you're getting the data back and it's giving you lots and lots of insight yeah um a couple of years ago i did it oh i lived in spain and i realized that I wanted to be able to read um, children's stories in Catalan to my kids. Um, and it was quite an effective way for me to focus my learning because I realized that I didn't really want to need to speak that much Catalan outside the home, but I wanted to prepare my kids for school. In the end, we didn't stay in Catalonia, but uh, it led me to focus on things like pronunciation um, and things like that of, of certain kinds of uh, language. And yeah, that was my outcome from my future ideal um, learner self. So yeah, you might be surprised when you start to think about it. And when learners start to think about it, surprising things can come out, I think. Okay, so uh, we'll just flip on there. So when I did this um, a couple of years ago, in particular, this data is from, but this is what I got from a group I was teaching in Spain. And it really helped me to plan a course for these guys around certain things or start it helped me to start to plan a course for them or to plan a series of lessons for them but it didn't give me like enough information to choose everything that i needed to bring into the classroom because if you look at this and this is kind of the classic thing that's going to happen is you're not finding like everybody has the same ideas no and sometimes things are more individual and you can't please everybody all the time okay so that's just an example of the outcome. Let's just take a kind of sidestep for a moment and think about something that's very connected to authenticity. Um, and I suppose back there kind of highlights it. You know, you have a group of learners and they don't all have the same, exactly, Peter, they don't all have the same needs and they don't have all the same interests. But you have to balance that, right, with the demands of what you're doing in the classroom. You have to find this is where we can become kind of better at our communicative goal choice for our courses, I think, where we can find also how we can differentiate. Because I think agency is the, is the key here, is giving learners a bit of choice and a bit of control over what we do in the classroom. So one way to do that, um, a kind of classic way, is to, when we bring text into the classroom, to not bring one text into the classroom, but to bring a couple of texts and to allow learners choice to choose what they want to read. Um, also, 
this aligns quite nicely with doing things that are real in the classroom because we often practice the, practice the skill of skimming or reading for gist. The thing is that reading for gist or skimming is not a skill that's actually really used in the real world unless we are doing this thing, which is selecting what to read. We really use skimming and gist reading to decide if we want to read something in more detail. So it can be a nice way to help learners match up the skill that you're practicing with the real world. So there's the authenticity there, I suppose. Um, the next thing that we could do to be even more agentive in our um, the way we approach text in the classroom is that we can give learners a whole selection of texts and they, they choose which one they want to read. This could be something that can be flipped or something in class. And when I say text, it could be um, reading, obviously, or listening. Uh, you can you can um, create you know a little set of texts, and again they could be they could be applying skills like skimming to choose from the bank, or you could have like the titles of the text or just the intro, like the first little bit of the text highlighted, and then they can choose from that. Um, and I suppose the most agentive way to bring class text into the classroom, which is not always really possible, I know, is that the learners select the texts. Yeah. So either the learners all select different texts, um, such as maybe like a, a news sharing um, lesson where every learner selects their own news story from the news that they've read, brings that to the class, not the actual text, but the summary of it. So there's some pre-lesson work done. And then you could do like a simple task based cycle where the learners share their news story with each other. Um, you do some feedback on how well they've been able to summarize and share that news story. You reorganize the class so they do it again you give a little bit more feedback on how well they've done it and then they do it a third time if you're really good at classroom management um, and by the end of the lesson they're better able to summarize a text because you've helped them the point would be that they've chosen what text they want to read and here you meet the different needs of the learners because they've read what they want to read now this is very much also connected with the idea of mediation um, this is, will be text mediation, which is a pretty big topic at the moment, I guess. Um, and there's been a recent book actually just published by, I'm putting the name in the chat. I'm really not good with pronunciation on these names. So Ethan Manser and Ricardo Chiapini, I think. Um, they've just released a book on mediation. So what I'm kind of talking about here about learners um, and said, uh, into the class, it, bring their own text or having to kind of relay text information. That's a kind of core component of mediation, text mediation. Um, Peter, you've asked what productive task. The productive task is to share, to summarize the text. So they've read the text, the news story, and their job in class is, is to summarize. That's the, the authentic thing that we do, isn't it? When we read things, we tell someone about them, we summarize them. Cool. OK, great. So uh, that was like a little sidestep into agency. Um, obviously, the agency you can give your learners is controlled by your context, of course. Um, yeah, exactly. They can decide what they find interesting, which one they'd like to read themselves. So then the learners could go off and read the text that um, each other have shared, et cetera, et cetera. And a whole chain of things can happen. OK, so uh, another tool, um, a needs analysis tool I use, to help kind of pinpoint exactly what text to bring in, especially if it's a situation where I have to bring one text into the class, because sometimes you do, because if you're working on reading skills, maybe, for example, the other lesson was maybe more of a productive speaking lesson. But if I want to focus on reading skills, I kind of need to bring something into the classroom to work on. Yeah, probably. And if I want to do that, how do I select which text to bring in? Well, one way to do it might be like this. Yeah. So my learners said that they were interested in reading news stories, if you remember back that Spanish group, but I had to decide which news story to bring in because not all news stories are equally interesting to people. So I used this very short speaking activity to help me identify which text might be the basis for the lesson. I think something about a task like this is that um, Sometimes learners will write on a needs analysis that they're interested, for example, in politics or current affairs, but not all politics stories are equally interesting to people. And if I was to choose one of these 
stories, I would choose maybe C or F, but I wouldn't necessarily choose A maybe, or yeah, maybe D I'm as interested in, but A and C are both political stories, but I'm not equally interested in them. So I think there's something to be said for kind of delving a bit deeper than just topic level, getting into a little bit more specifics than that with our learners. Um, and you can do this with anything. Like if you wanna do a TED talk, same idea. Um, if you wanna do books or if you wanna do a extensive reading and that's a really valuable thing to be doing with learners, maybe bringing in book covers to do a like mini reading lesson to choose the book. Um, or even just to, to work on reading book covers to, to help them select, you know, book um, summaries, what do they call them, blurbs. Um, yeah. And another one I, I personally really like using is the MOF, which is a podcast. I think podcasts can be a really valuable way to um, work with serialized, um, serialized listening. So the MOF is storytelling. Um, and to choose which story to bring in, because again, there's a whole lot of stories on there, I would get the learners to to look at the titles, yeah? Okay, so, uh, yeah, where are we at with the time, guys? Okay, so, um, so a quick one on reading tasks. You've got the text, you know your learners are gonna be interested, they've kind of almost chosen the text, um, but what do you do with it? Well, I mean, sort of common uh, wisdom that you've probably gained from your initial training and course books is that you do a gist task, and you do some detailed questions, do you? Because are they authentic things to do with text? Do we read for gist? Do we read for detail? Or if we do, is that what we're doing really? Or are we using those skills to do something else? And so the question is, how can we get to the doing the other thing in the reading class, not just the gist and the detail? Maybe we want to focus in on them, but to be honest, maybe we don't, maybe we don't need to, because maybe there's something more important, more authentic that we can do with the text. So I'm going to show you a text from a website called change.org which is maybe you're familiar with, um, a website where you, you can call people to action to do things related to kind of often global issues that uh, you want a bit of change to happen with. And a couple of years ago, I was teaching some learners and I realized that they were quite into this stuff. And so I found this text on change.org. Okay, so let's have a quick look at it. Um, your task is just to have a look at it and think what's the task you could set for the learners? Maybe. Could you think of three questions you could get the learners to answer that would help align the task that you set with the text? So working towards why the text was written, helping them read for communicative purpose, you might say. Maybe you can pop some ideas in the chat of any um, questions that we could ask the learners that would be authentic questions. Nice, Galina, exactly. Okay, so just for time reasons, maybe I'll just show you a couple and we can have a little think. So I think one question you could ask would be uh, the first question here, which is like, why is she unhappy? Maybe looking at the, the writer. So that's, she wrote for a reason because she's unhappy. So that would be aligning the purpose of the text with the reader. Do you empathize with her? She's looking for empathy, isn't she? She's looking for a response from you. So that would also nicely align with the purpose of the text. But I think probably the most, yeah, Galina's question and the last question here is probably the most um, communicatively aligned question that we could ask the learners to read for. Um, would you sign the petition? And I think in reading classes, we sometimes get to this question, but we often take a long time to get to this question. And it's not really always necessary for learners to do anything more than this and to be given enough time and support to do this with a text. 
but it's also really important that we do get to this with a text. So sometimes I think the opposite happens and we do all the gist and the detail and the guessing, the meaningful context and the, all the rest of it. And we forget that there needs to be a response to a text because if we go back to the definition of what a text is, it's been written for a reason. And the reason that the text has been written and the reason we read should be like completely in line with each other. That's authenticity at its heart, yeah? So when we are planning reading lessons, if we're using a course book or if we're using authentic materials, we need to try and incorporate those kinds of questions into our lessons. And we need to make sure that learners have space to answer them, that they're not just done, you know, open class for a moment, you know, that they are the main point. Yeah, they don't require action. I know, yeah, I chose a text, Peter, that particularly requires action. But there are still really important communicative questions that we can ask about text. We'll have a little look in a minute at a few more, Peter, but it's a really good point. Yeah, not all texts ask you for action, but they have all been written for a reason. And if they're authentic, our job as a teacher is to identify why were they written and to help our learners read for that reason. So let's do a couple. I mean, example, for example, why was a why was a, um, a newspaper article written? Why would why are newspaper articles written? Perfect. So if newspaper articles are written to inform readers, then we have to ask learners if they're reading a newspaper article, do you feel more informed? Is there anything else you'd like to read about this text, about this topic? Do you want to go and explore more? Do you want to find out like the next article related to this? Would you like to read another person's point of view on this? Um, if they're written to persuade, we have to ask them, are you persuaded? Yeah. But I think the, the top, the point of information sharing has to be acknowledged as a communicative act. And we have to ask learners, do they feel informed? So if learners, if it is an information piece or something, do you feel informed about this? Are there questions you still have? Exactly, so exactly. So depending on why the text was written, we have to come up with the question that we ask. Yeah, I'm not saying it always has to be <laughs> a call to action as clear as the petition, but I was using that as an example. Okay, so, um, this is another way to use, I suppose, stories, um, newspaper things and things that are in the news. So the authentic text we often think of as being the, um, the reading. Yeah, that's the authentic text. Sometimes uh, the authentic text might not be the reading. It might be someone's response to the reading. So here what I'm talking about is, you know, you read a new story and then you give your opinion about it. And I think this is a really nice way to yeah, build a real communicative focus on like listening skills and, and kind of integrated skills into the classroom. But it's a really nice way to do a listening kind of thing, especially in a sequence of lessons. If learners have read something or if you've set some kind of reading stuff, the lesson that you're actually, you could actually teach is someone else's response to the list, to, to, to the text, yeah? Or it could be the follow-up lesson, uh, maybe, and I, I will show you that, what I mean here. This is um, something that, that was pre-pandemic. I don't know if you heard about this um, news story. It was a, a thing that was run in Ireland for an island off the coast of Ireland. And um, it generated a lot of interest in Ireland for people to apply, a real, it was a real thing. Um, and so I brought this into the classroom but not for them to read the newspaper article about it, but for, for, for a topic of conversation. Um, I'm gonna just flick over this slide because that was that slide that I just showed was brainstorming with some teacher trainers and you'll get to see it in the, in the, the slides. But the point is that you bring a news story into the class and maybe what you listen to is someone's response to it. So you get your friends to record their opinions. Again, I'm not gonna play this recording because it'll just take a little bit too long, but you, you turn it into a listening lesson, basically. And sometimes I think when we, Peter, Peter asked at the beginning, how can we like make authentic texts? Like how can we simplify them? I think one way we can do them is turn them into a spoken text as a, as a response or an opinion thing. So we can use 
the written text, learners can read it or explore it if they want to with their own devices and all that kind of stuff. But maybe what we focus on is building, developing listening skills from authentic material. And we create our own authentic material in this case, because we ask a couple of friends, can you give me a response to this? Um, and I think just in general, crowdsourcing from our friends um, is a really great way to get authentic listening material. It's also a great way to get authentic writing material if they're writing messages or things like that. If you ask them to share their opinion about something. Mm. This is kind of somewhere in between, you know, like 100% authentic and pedagogically authentic. It's you're, you're asking them to do it for your learners, I guess, but they're not like teachers, you know, and even if you can get, you can even get teachers to do it, but they're not super controlling their language. Yeah. And if they make it too fast or whatever, you can ask them to do it again a bit slower. Um, so yeah, I think getting our friends or family, I like to get my family to do this a lot. In fact, my sister um, is a person I use a lot. This is my sister. I often will send her a little message and she'll record me in a bit of audio. Um, she's learning Spanish. So um, I've used her a lot for her Spanish learning, like giving tips about being a learner because that really kind of aligns with my learners um, goals and things like that. Um, so a classic kind of sequence might be for a bit of listening would be, um, you know, listen for what the person is talking about, then maybe listen in again, this is like a detailed task, and then finally work on maybe something perceptually difficult within the text. So this would be a kind of really classic delta or dip listening staging of a lesson with a very small amount of audio. We're talking about 20 or 30 seconds worth of audio here, yeah? So when we do listening work, we're not talking about listening to four minutes or five minutes. We're talking about being very um, efficient with the material we bring into the classroom. So this is a very simple sequence that might work. And then this task down here, task three, kind of gets done. And then you go back to task two and you go around again. And this is how you help learners work with what's called decoding or perceptual difficulties with text. Yeah, A really simple cycle that can be used uh, really effectively, but the shorter the audio, the better. So this is why I like crowdsource material. Um, because you can get people to record a 30 second or even a minute maybe of a response to something. Uh, okay, let's finally get to a tiny um, bit of, I mean, further ideas maybe about productive tasks. I think when you're designing a productive task for the classroom and you want to focus on authenticity, the main question you should be asking yourself is, would you do that task in English? What I mean is, this goes back to that regrets thing. Would you talk about your regrets? Maybe, maybe not. So refining tasks until they reach a point where they feel for you like, yeah, that's something I would do. And if you're teaching maybe like younger learners or teens, it's like putting yourself into that frame and figuring out, would you do it? Yeah, that's a really important reflection question, I think, for ourselves. Um, is there a real communicative goal? And maybe for productive tasks, could we help our learners by creating a kind of authentic model for them? Yeah, so this is where maybe crowdsourcing or perhaps uh, our own model, we could write it ourselves, or well, not write it ourselves, I mean, record it or, or create it, write, write it ourselves, yeah? But authentic in the sense that you're, it's task related, yeah? It's not to present or display language. So again, this is kind of a bridge between the, um, real, real world and the classroom world. <clears throat> um, one really like simple task that I use with these things in mind is the kind of snap and share. So it's like take out your phone and share a photo. Yeah, it's a really kind of it's a thing I do a lot or share photos with friends. Um, I we send photos all the time, I think, to people and we used to be in the same place talking about them, but I think nowadays probably we're more remotely talking about them or, or, or sharing opinions. And when you do this kind of thing with a lower level, so Peter, again, Peter asked about, you know, how can we do this for low levels? When you're creating a model for what the learners might want to do, I think we can work on a kind of script, not scripting, but rehearsal kind of point of view. So if we're going to record, for example, this is a photo that I took in a festival a while ago. 
a few years ago now in Spain. If I was going to get my learners to also share photos of like festivals or events that they've attended, I would prepare a very short version of me talking about this picture. And I would record it and I would reflect on its level, uh, you know, appropriacy, and I might re-record it. But I wouldn't sit down and type out a tape script for myself to read. Does that make sense? So you're kind of using a kind of process of self-reflection to create the materials. There's a sort of semi-authenticity to it, yeah? Um, and it's the same with a written text, yeah? We need to kind of keep things in mind. Uh, we're not going to have time for that. I'm really sorry. Um, okay, so uh, almost finished is when we are designing tasks, one framework that we can use is the kind of task-based framework for, for productive tasks. And these are a very, this is a very long list of possible communicative things that we do when we produce language. Um, and a good task might involve like one, two, or three of these things. So this is from Thornbury and um, based on Jane Willis's task-based stuff. But um, the words kind of seem a bit funny, some of them, maybe like transcoding, recoding. Yeah? Um, but they're really simple things. But they're things that we can include in our task design when we design a productive task that can help build authenticity. Because these are things that uh, have quite kind of strong communicative function in them. Um, and we do them often together with other people. Uh, some of them are more pedagogically bound, I think, like matching, <laughs> maybe. And some of them are more like real world, like choosing or reaching a consensus. Um, but they all have very strong communicative value. Um, and if you were kind of doing something festival related, here's a kind of example for each of these types of productive task. Here is what, what the lesson might be. If that makes sense. So you wouldn't do all of these things, <laughs> but you could do like a couple of them. Um, and they would be, any one of them would be a very um, authentic, productive task. And extremely productive as well. They would produce a lot of language. And the, the other references at the bottom. Okay, so I think we're almost, almost out of time. And I just want to finish with one thought. It's kind of related to something earlier um, that came up about yeah, what we do with text. And I suppose what, what's the most authentic thing that we do with any text, with a conversation, with an um, experience, with a, you know, with a conversation, a, a reading thing we've read or a thing we've heard or a thing we've watched. Um, I think probably the most authentic thing that we do is that we tell someone about it. Yeah, so when you're working um, with a text that, you've, that learners have read, the response they could have to that text, the communicative response could simply be like, will you tell anyone about this text? And who will you tell? And why will you tell them? And what will you tell them? Um, it could be something as simple as, um, yeah, exactly, Mary, we share it, yeah? We share those things. That is the communicative response to most text input. Um, and whether we share that we liked it or didn't like it, or whether we share the whole content the summary, that's kind of up to us, isn't it? But I think if we want to be very authentic in our lessons, we should try to build in a little bit of this kind of um, questioning of our learners, yeah? So it can be related to the whole lesson or just to the text. And if we consider the, the lesson as a text, we can also ask learners at the end of a lesson, who will you tell about this lesson today? Yeah, I, this is a really common thing to do with young learners especially, but it's more about um, filtering, I think, uh, what they go home and tell people about. <laughs> but with, uh, with adult learners, it's about also assessing how well you've met their needs because authenticity is also something that feeds forward in a course. And if we've mm, kind of misstepped or done something wrong, we need to probably hear it from the horse's mouth. But again, that question of, did you enjoy the lesson today or did you like the lesson? I think isn't the right question always to ask because it sometimes gets back the answer of, yeah, yeah, it was great. Or yes, teacher, yes, yes, it's very useful. But if you focus more on the content um, and on the communicative 
element of the lesson, you might get back more meaningful response from the learners. learners. So yeah, this is something that I like to use and you can refine it and adapt it obviously for, for the lesson. So that's it for the session. Um, there is also a bibliography and the summary might be something like, have some communicative goals in your lessons, maybe generate your own authentic text and you can use um, TD Lab staff room on Facebook for crowdsourcing material for, for listening, but I'm sure you also have friends and family who you can ask to record things. And um, make sure you think about the purpose of a text so that you're generating authentic speaking and writing and get some feedback if you're on the right track or if you need to adapt your approach. Okay, so that's it. It was lovely to have you all. Thanks for coming. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. You're all very welcome. I think, and maybe Peter's gone, but I think something that we didn't have a lot of time to talk about is the use of authentic material that might be too difficult for learners. Um, and an idea that I would encourage you to uh, explore anybody who's interested in this is something called uh, 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 it's called text elaboration. So you can take a very difficult text and instead of simplifying it, you can actually add to it to help learners um, uh, better able to process it. It's kind of like you paraphrase and you gloss within the text. It's an idea that comes from Mike Long as well. Um, so you can look it up. It is big in the task-based world for input texts, but I think it's also a really useful way for us to bring um, authentic material into our lessons. Much easier for reading texts than listening texts. But yeah, it's about like adding a little bit of extra language so that they don't stumble as much. Or find it as demotivating. The text becomes a kind of um, tool to help you understand the text. And the slides, we will send everyone who attended the slides and also we'll pop them up on the, um, sorry, the slides and the, and the recording and we'll also pop them up on the, on the, on the website. Have a lovely Friday morning, afternoon or evening, <laughs> wherever you are. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you so much, Miss Emma. <laughs> Thank You're you very welcome. much. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a nice weekend. Yeah, have a lovely weekend, everybody. Have a nice weekend. Bye. Bye bye. Okay, bye.